Well, welcome to another session of the 68th Annual Utah State Historical Society Conference. It's on the theme, Rights and Responsibilities. And for those of you tuning in, all conference programming is being held virtually this year in a full listing of our keynote, plenary, and other session information is available on our website at ushs.utah.gov. Um, and today, uh, really excited about this session that we have planned. It's called The Right Record, Rights and Responsibilities in Utah Government Records. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Gina Strack of the Utah State Archives and Records Service to introduce the session and the session speakers. Hello and welcome to our session about the rights and responsibilities in Utah government records. My name is Gina Strack and I'll be the moderator today along with my colleagues from the Utah State Archives and Records Service. I'm the Digital Archives Manager wherein I oversee digital collections for online public access along with being a processing archivist working mostly in the area of government records, vital records. I have been with the archives since 2002. I'm a certified archivist and hold an MLIS from the University of Washington and a certificate as a digital archive specialist from the Society of American Archivists. Mahalo Riddell is also an archivist at the Utah State Archives, where she primarily works with local government records. She also serves as Executive Secretary for the Utah State Historical Records Advisory Board, or USHRAB. She has a Master of Arts in History from the University of New Hampshire. Jim Kitches is the Assistant Director of the Utah State Archives, where he has worked since 2002. He has processed numerous record series, managed digitization projects, created and overseen an outreach program, provided reference service, is the coordinator for USHRAB, and manages our preservation and access program. He holds a master's degree in the environmental humanities from the University of Utah and an MLIS degree from Drexel University. He's a certified archivist and a digital archive specialist as well. For this session, we chose the title of the right record due to a mantra we use at the archives for the right record to the right person at the right time. The Utah State Archives has a mission and mandate to document the history of government in Utah through the preservation of government records. Archivists will, prevent, will present specific types of and selections from historical records that document government actions. Government, often in retrospect, does not always behave admirably. We'll show how the records kept in government gives us a glimpse into changing functions and perspective here in Utah. I will start by acknowledging that I'm currently speaking from the traditional lands of the Eastern Shoshone and Goshute people. On the subject of native and citizenship rights in vital records, my background of 19th century Mormon pioneers, though pretty typical for Utah, means I gave little thought to native issues outside of sparse coverage in history class. However, a few years ago, I took on a project related to the vital records I already processed for public access at the Utah State Archives. The staff of the Office of Vital Records and Statistics was reviewing their historical records and decided that they would like to transfer a small set of records to the archives labeled only Indian birth certificates. Beyond a short description, there was little known about these records. I ended up with a few questions to research, including why are these certificates filed separately from other birth certificates? Were there laws or policies that governed their creation? Is there a reason for the range of dates of these records from about 1916 to 1952. If birth certificates are now used for citizenship and the related right to vote, is there a relationship between that and these records? What I discovered is the bulk of today's presentation. Today we might take for granted the fact of citizenship for anyone born in the United States of America. This was not always a safe assumption. Even after the constitutional amendment that created birthright citizenship, 
the rights of and stemming from citizenship were still not always available to all people. Citizenship was barely an issue for the original framers of the Constitution. They never even defined it. The white, mostly British settlers created only a procedure for naturalization, completely ignoring those enslaved here already and anyone else not eligible to participate in the enlightened political society. In the run-up to the Civil War, the Dred Scott Supreme Court decision made the absence worse by positing that because certain people, including those enslaved, were, quote, considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings, end quote, they had no rights and privileges and were not included under the generic people in the Constitution, let alone as a citizen. The Civil War and especially the Reconstruction era constitutional amendments changed everything about citizenship. Between the end of the Civil War and the last decades of the 20th century, American governments at every level of the federal system developed a new reliance on official records about individuals. In 1868, the 14th Amendment established birthright citizenship as the law of the land, declaring that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Governments experimented with new record keeping technologies in order to record the existence of citizens, to pinpoint individuals by name, and to calculate useful statistics for governing the population. Initially, governments did so in fragmentary, incomplete, and partial ways, but over time, the registration systems became more complete. Before delving into those registration systems and official records, let's consider how the status of Native, Native American citizenship may have affected the application of these new record-keeping technologies. For about the first century of relations between the U.S. government and individual tribes, they settled negotiations with treaties, often in exchange for more land being made available for white settlers. In 1830, the Indian Removal Act required that all tribes east of the Mississippi River be forced to live on the western side, abandoning their traditional lands. Every tribe that was removed negotiated a treaty, with some providing the opportunity for Native Americans to become citizens, though usually contingent on also becoming assimilated into white society. In con it continued with other tribes as westward expansion created pressure for still more land to be opened by for white settlement. As one example, the 1855 treaty with the Wyandot increased the cost of citizenship even more by completely dissolving the tribe and its relationship with the U.S. government. They would not reform again until well into the 20th century. Treaty making stopped completely in 1871, and the final steps of assimilation came with the Dawes Act in 1887, which granted allotments of land to Native Americans after dissolving communal tribal property. At about the same time, the 14th Amendment was explicitly not allowed to apply to Native Americans, with the Su U.S. Supreme Court citing its exclusion of Indians not taxed, which I'll come back to in a minute. Part of the Dawes Act included the granting of citizenship, but only after a period during which allotted land was held in trust. This did eventually lead to about half of the Native American population obtaining citizenship by World War I. All in all, Native Americans had been removed from the Eastern states, subdued by force and settled into reservations in the Western states and territories, and had been unable to secure citizenship for all tribal members. Without that citizenship, suffrage and voting were generally cut off as well. A few individuals did try and were cut off after courts deemed that even years of living in white society as a citizen was not enough to obtain the right to vote. Thousands of Native Americans volunteered to fight in World War I, both citizens and non-citizens. Much as suffragists protested that the U.S. was fighting for democracy abroad, but not practicing it at home, some realized that it was too ironic for Native American servicemen to be fighting for a country that may not consider them citizens at all. After the war in 1919, Congress declared that all Native Americans who had been honorably discharged could now become citizens. And then in 1924, four years after the 19th Amendment guaranteed female suffrage, the Indian Citizenship Act was passed to grant citizenship to all remaining Native Americans. However, much as African American women were still subject to vote suppression due to race, many Native American men and women faced barriers, especially in Western states with large Native populations. 
Utah was among them, not only with laws regarding voting and voter registration, but also as it now appears with vital records. The growth of vital records in Utah closely follows national trends in public health in the late 19th and early 20th century, while some larger and older cities began issuing birth and death certificates decades earlier, most states came online during this period. The statistics gathered by documenting these events provided data on mortality, diseases, and other issues taken up by public health advocates. In 1898, the first attempt at a statewide solution was assigned to county clerks in Utah. A system of reporting was set up from physicians, midwives, and others to report quarterly to the county clerk, who would then create an entry in a birth or death register volume. Even with pre-printed forms and education efforts, many people were missed in this registration. So in 1905, a new solution was created that would place the responsibility within the State Board of Health, centering the purpose of vital records within the public health sphere. There would still be a network of reporting, but it would now be a series of registration districts with appointed registrars. This is essentially the predecessor of our current local health districts. Senate Bill 102 defined the duties of the new program, including the issuance of birth and death certificates and burial permits, and even providing for penalties for violations. Citizenship status was not really a part of this yet. It was only later that proving birth within the boundaries of the state would also serve as a proof of citizenship. It still took a few years for full compliance, but Utah was one of the first states to do so by 1917. Almost immediately, exceptions cropped up. One of those with a shaky start was delayed birth certificates. At first, the standard form was used and simply stored separately. Later legislation formalized the process, especially in response to a surge of requests around World War II for soldiers and defense workers to prove their citizenship with birth certificates when many adults didn't have one. Yet another exception, due to geographic location, residency, race, or all of the above, a separate set of Indian birth certificates began as soon as 1916. Most, if not all, the individuals in these certificates were born on one of the reservations in Utah. One or both parents are also considered Indian as a race. Some certificates indicate the specific tribe, and a few also include the amount of Indian blood in quarters, such as one quarter or four quarters. Various standard certificates are found in this series, including from the U.S. Census Bureau, Utah, and neighboring states. The information on certificates may include the child's name, place of birth, date of birth, sex, and if the, if the child is part of a multiple birth. Also the parents' names, race, age, birthplace, occupation, marital status, and a record of children previously born to the mother. In later years, for more health statistics, the data included length of the pregnancy, the child's weight and length at birth, the date of the serological test, a description of any complications, and a description of any congenital malformations or birth injuries. Since birth certificates are private for 100 years, I can only show the earliest ones before some of these later practices became active. Let's take a look. This is the very first certificate in the series. A few details to note for a birth in 1916. The tribal name of Shoshone is written across the top. It appears that this may have been handled by the Shoshone Indian Agency by the typed info at the top left. The color or race is Shoshone Indian, in, Indian for the mother, but white for the father. The certificate does not have a registration or file date like most of these certificates. We did retain an interesting note within the records that it should be considered that all records in this book are registered as of January 15, 1960. Still in the same area of Uinta County, the next certificate also uses a form from the Census Bureau, not the Utah Standard Form. We see some numbering that may have been after the fact, with this one being 1A to follow the previous number one, but also annotated to be state Indian file number. This is another white father and Native American mother. This one does have a filing date of August 15, 1940, by which time some facts like the physician's full name was not remembered. 
As it turns out, this certificate was created from a signed affidavit, a common practice with delayed birth certificates, but occasionally showing up just like this in the regular run of registered births. Despite my research, I was never able to completely answer the question of why were these certificates maintained separately. I even had vital record staff ask around the office seeking institutional memory. As best as I can conclude, the practice of Indian birth certificates seems to rest on residency and interpretations thereof, including Indians not taxed. The Constitution of the State of Utah in 1895 set out to make no distinction in civil or political rights on account of race or color, except as to Indians not taxed. The status of not taxed stems from the United States Constitution and is also found in the 14th Amendment. Interpretations over time, such as for the federal census, eventually settled upon a definition of Native Americans as individuals living on tribal lands and not assimilated into white society. This is reflected in a Utah Constitutional Convention discussion on elections and suffrage that the post-Civil War 15th Amendment, which granted the right to vote without regard to race, quote, gives the Indian Aborigines of this country the right when the, he severs his tribal relations and is taxed, end quote. I believe it's possible that the reason these birth certificates were maintained separately is that Native Americans living on reservations, though now citizens, were not considered residents of their local areas and jurisdictions. The bulk of the certificates ends by the early 1940s, signaling a possible change in registration practice. Utah eliminated requirements to register to vote with an address not on a reservation in 1957 with House Bill 31. Utah was the second to last in doing this for Native Americans choosing to retain their tribal affiliations part of a larger evolution of the relationship between Utah governmental entities and Native Americans. Lingering voting issues did remain here and there, which led to certain areas in Alaska, Arizona, and South Dakota with large reservations being included in amendments to the 1965 Voting Rights Act special provisions in 1972. However, as of 2013, Alaska and Arizona are no longer covered. After decades of trying to erase individual tribal identity and cultures with assimilation, the Utah government started reversing course with the closure of boarding schools, improved recognition of land rights, and saving dying languages and culture. Native issues still abound today though, including very recently with an interesting decision by the Supreme Court regarding jurisdiction in Oklahoma. While preparing this presentation, one of my regular YouTube channel subscriptions covered the July 2020 decisions from a legal perspective. It seems once you start paying attention, you can't help but see a bigger picture of what is sometimes called Indian country. Unfortunately, social ills also remain, remain abundant, including poor health care, poverty, unemployment, and an epidemic of domestic violence. In 1953, Utah formed the Commission on State Indian Affairs, Commission of Indian Affairs, is to promote positive intergovernmental relations and the government-to-government -government relationship between the state of Utah and Utah's American Indian tribes. It also focuses on providing information through various educational initiatives and curricula. As the saying goes, mighty oaks form from little acorns grow. The exposure to and research for these Native American birth certificates changed my awareness and perspective. I began paying attention and seeing more around me. Although there is no longer any institutional memory about these particular birth certificates, they were at least kept and will now be housed permanently and securely within the Utah State Archives. Any individual on these certificates can today also obtain a certified copy from the capable staff of the Office of Vital Records and Statistics. The research I pursued, a normal function of being an archivist, is now captured in a finding aid description openly available and inviting all to access. Academic scholars, information professionals such as myself, and advocates of all kinds regularly use and build upon original records such as these. Government records document who we are as a people and society. When properly managed and preserved, they will continue to provide insight for future generations to come. Thank you for the opportunity to share these unique records from the Utah State Archives. We have well over a million records online free to access along with the permanent collection that we are very proud to care for.
All right, thank you, Gina. That was super fascinating. Um, so as Gina mentioned at the top of this panel, um, I, my name is Mahala Riddell. I'm also an archivist at the State Archives, and I'll be shifting gears a little to talk now about the concept of rights during World War II, particularly as it relates to enemy aliens and Japanese Americans. So if we operate under the assumption that government exists to protect and guarantee the rights of citizens, what do we make of a situation in which government does the opposite? Philosopher Hannah Arendt was the first to coin the phrase, the right to have rights. Arendt was writing in 1949, arguing in an article that would eventually morph into her well-known publication, The Origins of Totalitarianism. In response to the newly formed United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, Arendt expressed skepticism. Rights, she argued, should be recognized by all of humanity, but is all of humanity capable of doing so? Even if backed by the UN, such a declaration of human rights would mean nothing if such rights are not recognized and granted by the world's governments to their citizens. To have rights, Arendt believed, one must be a citizen of a country willing to grant those rights. But therein lies the catch as argued by historian May Ngai in her book, Impossible Subjects. Citizenship might be the right to have rights, but citizenship must in turn be recognized by a state that would be the guarantor of those rights. So zooming out a bit, let's look at this concept in the context of the Second World War. Though war had been raging in Europe for two years, by 1941, the United States was still reluctant to officially join. The surprise attack by Japanese forces on Pearl Harbor on December 7th changed that, and the U.S. burst onto the world scene. Immediately following the attack, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Proclamations 2525, 2526, and 2527. These proclamations gave the United States the authority to detain allegedly potentially dangerous enemy aliens. Quote, now therefore I, Franklin D. Roosevelt, as President of the United States and as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, do hereby make public proclamation to all whom it may concern that an invasion has been perpetrated upon the territory of the United States by the Empire of Japan, Roosevelt declared on December 7th. He declared that all native citizens, denizens, or subjects of the Empire of Japan, being of the age 14 years and upwards, who shall be within the United States or within any territories in any way subject to the jurisdiction of the United States and not actually naturalized, shall be termed alien enemies. The proclamation also made it illegal for such residents of the U.S. to have in his possession custody or control at any time or place or use firearms, bombs, ammunition, shortwave radios, signal devices, cameras, maps depicting military sites, and more. So let's dissect the language of these proclamations. The proclamation notes that anyone 14 or older understood to be a subject of Japan but residing in the United States was thereafter a quote, enemy alien. Perhaps in this context, um, then it might be understandable to want a register of such Japanese subjects in order to better track their movement within the US. Yet the historical record shows us that it was not just Japanese subjects, but American citizens of Japanese descent who were considered alien enemies and were thus registered, tracked, and in the case of residents of the West Coast, interned for the duration of the war. Surely American citizens have the rights and protections of the government, which should include the right to not be interned without solid evidence of wrongdoing. So how did we get from a proclamation against non-citizens to the registration of internment and internment of citizens. Recalling May and Guy's work, Impossible Subjects, which I mentioned a moment ago, the idea of a citizen and an alien are oppositional terms. The alien is not supposed to engage in citizenship and a citizen can no longer be an alien. This is where discrimination gets to work. For decades, from the onset of Japanese immigration to Hawaii and the United States in the late 19th century, Americans have resisted the newcomers on the, mostly on the grounds of racism. Discriminatory practices prior to World War II existed in the form of federal immigration and naturalization laws restricting Japanese immigration, in the form of prohibitions on Japanese aliens 
resident aliens owning land in the form of segregation in schools, particularly in California, in the resentment on the part of Euro-Americans who considered the Japanese to be economic competition, and in rampant misunderstandings of Japanese cultural patterns. First-generation Japanese immigrants, or those born in Japan, were not eligible for American citizenship. The second generation, born on American soil, were citizens. But this did not prevent this second generation from experiencing the same discriminatory practices their fathers and mothers did. Citizens or not, many Americans treated people of Japanese descent as foreigners incapable of assimilating into American life. The Denver Post, a rabidly anti-Japanese publication prior to and during World War II, summed it up this way. Japanese Americans, quote, were not genuine citizens, but inadmissible and untrustworthy. The Davis County Clipper, right here in Utah, published encouragement to citizens to not sell or rent land or homes to either foreign or American-born Japanese. Many from the Japanese community worked hard to counter these prevailing American prejudices. Sunao Ishio, editor of the English language section of the Utah Nippo, published in Salt Lake City, wrote that for the Nikkei, or people of Japanese descent living in America, to survive, they needed to, at all costs, preserve the American way of life. Quote, let there not be found within the Japanese American community one to criticize the course set by the people of the United States, Ishio wrote on October 8, 1941. It was into this context that Roosevelt's pre presidential proclamations defining alien enemies was published. Close on its heels came Executive Order 9066, which established an exclusion zone on the West Coast and paved the way for mass internment of Japanese Americans. The proclamation and executive order were not without controversy in their time. Though most agreed with them in principle, even the United States government struggled to justify the internment of American citizens alongside Japanese-born immigrants. The Yale Law Journal published an article in 19, June 1942 which broke down each argument presented by the government in an effort to establish the one most sound in legal justification. Quote, the, sub the scope of the problem is enlarged, the editors of the journal wrote, because widespread control must be exercised not only over aliens of enemy nationality, but also over United States citizens. In the subsequent breakdown of the legality of Roosevelt's orders, the journal hearkened back to many of the prejudices extant throughout the United States, but particularly in the West. Such American-born Japanese, they believed, quote, are not assimilated into American life and retain many cultural ties with Japan, although individuals of any group, of other groups may be enemy sympathizers, every German or Italian alien and every member of the Japanese race is suspect as a potential enemy agent. This could be for many reasons, the journal ar argued. For instance, many contended that American-born people of Japanese descent were more dangerous than the older generation because they felt more keenly the, the discrimination against the Japanese. Presumably, the journal, ar journal editors were positing that American citizens of Japanese descent might feel more acutely the sting of discriminatory practices precisely because they were citizens and thus should not, in a perfect world, be subject to discrimination in general. Additionally, the journal also pointed out that if an American-born Japanese child was registered at a Japanese consulate within 14 days of birth, or born prior to 1924, and then did not renounce Japanese citizenship at age 20, Japan recognized them as citizens. This was in addition to their birthright American citizenship. Quote, it is possible to step from this conclusion from this to the conclusion that during the war with Japan, we can deny American born Japanese the rights of American citizens on the grounds that they may owe allegiance to Japan, the journal stated. And lastly, again, relying on prejudicial beliefs, the journal theorized that the courts might stress the peculiar situation of the Japanese as a distinctive racial group, unassimilated into American culture and preserving many cultural and economic ties with Japan. It could be further argued that the loyalty of the Japanese as a group is open to sus suspicion because of their unassimilated position. Remarkably, the journal even suggested that legal justification could be sought 
on the ground on the argument that relocation and internment protected Japanese Americans and that for their own sake and to safeguard them from potentially violent public opinion in the West, quote, the strict letter of constitutional guarantees may be lifted for the duration of the emergency. In the end, the journal concluded that most of these arguments would not hold up against legal precedent. Legal justification for the registration and internment of Japanese Americans must be predicated on military necessity, demonstrable in a court of law, and not on the inherent lack of rights of persons restrained, the editor stated. Yet the arguments of the Yale Law Journal brought up were, were the arguments used throughout American society to justify the actions of the American government and so-called military necessity or not, Japanese Americans, including American-born citizens, faced curfews, restrictions, arrest, and internment without a hint of cause. So where do we see this in the record? The Utah State Archives has documentation from this era that gives us proof of the events that transpired which stripped the rights of Japanese Americans. I'm going to share a handful of these records for us to view and analyze. For one, when Roosevelt issued his proclamation calling for the registration of alien enemies, he left it up to local branches of the American justice system to carry out the necessary steps in the process. In December 1941, the Davis County Clipper published a short notification that Sheriff Joseph Holbrook registered the entire colony of Japanese and Japanese Americans in North Davis, upwards of 450 people. The Utah State Archives has the records from this process. Known as the Alien Enemy Registration Forms, this collection documents individuals and families of Japanese descent living in Davis County from 1940 to 1945. Seen here on this slide, the registration forms contain information about the names and addresses of the heads of households, landlord or employer's names and addresses, family members' names, birth dates, birthplaces, and registration numbers, as well as the number and types of firearms and ammunition belonging to each individual or family. If you recall, Roosevelt's presidential proclamation declaring natives of Japan and in effect American-born people of Japanese descent as well to be alien enemies also prohibited them from owning guns, ammunition, and other weaponry, as well as shortwave radios and cameras. The sheriff collected information related to these items so that they could be removed. In March 1942, the Clipper mentioned that 65 guns and 1,225 rounds of ammunition had been turned over by Holbrook to the U.S. Marshal. Classifying Japanese Americans as aliens helped remove the protections of citizens from them, making it easier to deny or violate rights otherwise guaranteed to them. Davis County's Japanese Americans worked hard to counteract this process. In the midst of the registration process, a group met with Sheriff Holbrook to, quote, discuss the various phases of the Japanese situation in the county. All present pledged loyalty to the United States. Yet all also found themselves ple pledging to, quote, not go out unless necessary for living ex essentials. Despite professing to the county sheriff that they had no ill will or nefarious designs on the country they called home, they were forced to follow curfews and were subjected to discriminatory processes such as land ownership bans. Shortly after registering as alien enemies, the community got together to form a local chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, or JACL. The JACL was a national organization founded in the 1920s to work to expand the rights of Japanese in America, particularly citizenship rights. Within hours after the Pearl Harbor bombing, as the U.S. government began arresting leaders in many Japanese communities in the U.S., the JACL placed primary emphasis on defending those arrested in court and countering the rumors of supposed Japanese-American-backed efforts to undermine American security. Viewed with suspicion by many Americans anyway, the JACL made an even made an effort to organize Japanese-American communities to cooperate and peacefully follow relocation orders. When Davis County's chapter formed, they made sure to indicate that they were doing so, quote, for the purpose of working in close harmony with state and county law enforcement officers. According to newspaper reports, though, the group was still subject to tight control by Davis County's white leaders. The group was required to meet in American-owned buildings, the county determined, and all meetings must be attended by two Americans, both appointed by the sheriff. 
Who are some of the people in Davis County affected by all of this? The newspaper specifically called out Taki or Takeo Nakano. Nakano, the Clipper reported, helped Sheriff Holbrook gather the information he needed during the alien enemy registration process. He later served as president of the county's chapter of the JACL. Nakano came from a farming family. Born in the U.S. and thus a citizen, he was the child of a Japanese farmer and lived in Davis County with his parents, brothers, and sisters. Leading up to and during the war, he was very involved in the local Red Cross. His name repeatedly shows up in the papers as organizing drives to support the Red Cross and raising hundreds of dollars for its work. After the war, he moved to Idaho, where he lived and farmed until his death. Another named mention, name mentioned is Takasugi. The Takasugi family, like the Nakanos, had lived in Davis County for years. Patriarch Genzo Takasugi had arrived in the U.S. in 1906. He moved to Syracuse and worked on the Barnes farm where he and his wife raised many children. Two, Junji, called Johnny, and Michio, called Mitch, eventually joined the U.S. military to fight in World War II. Mitch served in Europe as part of the Quartermaster's Corps. According to his obituary, he was even able to attend and observe the Nuremberg trials after the war's end. Johnny was a member of the famed 442nd Infantry Regiment, a regiment organized in 1943 and comprised almost entirely of second generation American born young men of Japanese descent. Most Japanese Americans were banned from serving in the Pacific Theater. As part of the 442nd, Johnny and the rest of his unit served in Europe. The celebrated exploits of the 442nd Regiment did help ease some anti-Japanese American sentiment, particularly at higher levels of government, and contributed, along with the fact that the war itself ended, to the eventual release of interned Japanese. However, it did little to change the mindset of the general American public. The experiences of Japanese Americans during the Second World War were steeped in the oppositional nature of simultaneously existing as aliens and citizens. They occupied a space not meant to be shared in such a way. They were born on American soil and yet were registered as enemies of the country they called home. They gave up their guns when required, but were then handed guns and told to put their lives at risk overseas. The government never formally stripped Japanese Americans of their citizenship, but their rights were in effect nullified. In the blink of an eye, Japanese Americans went from citizens to non-aliens, and to the rest of this co the country, blinded by prejudice, that shift seemed to make perfect sense. May Ngai and fellow historian Letty Volpe remind us plainly that non-alien and citizen are not equivalent terms. The first, Volpe stated, promised a panoply of rights and guarantees. The other only speaks a negation, one that promises no guidance as to the positive status of the person, nor any sense as to where she might ground her rights. So where does this get us today? In the 1980s, the US Congress put together a commission to investigate Japanese internment and the government's justification of it. Those said throughout the 1940s to be an action required by military necessity to protect the portion of the country most at risk of Japanese-led attack the commission found that no such military necessity existed. Quote, the promulgation of Executive Order 9066 was not justified by military necessity and the decisions which followed from it were not driven by analysis of military conditions. The broad historical causes which shaped these decisions were race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Widespread ignorance of Japanese Americans contributed to a policy conceived in haste and ex executed in an atmosphere of fear and anger at Japan. A grave injustice was done to American citizens and resident aliens of Japanese ancestry who, without individual re review or any probative evidence against them, were excluded, removed, and detained by the United States during World War II. Do we remember what Hannah Arendt said? Citizenship is the right to have rights. Government is the guarantor of the rights of its citizens. What happens when a government reneges on its duty? Mistakes, discrimination, prejudice, the internment of citizens, a stripping of rights and reclassification of the body. And yet we can learn something from this. 
the Congressional Commission was able to come to its conclusions because government records documenting decisions and actions exist. We are able to look at the holdings of the Utah State Archives, review the collections that speak to troubling government-backed decisions regarding the rights of its citizens, and we are able to study and draw new, and hopefully better, conclusions. And with that, I just want to say thanks to the Utah State Historical Society for this opportunity and then pass it off to Jim Kitches. Thank you very much, Mahala. As my colleagues have demonstrated, government records are a critical documentary resource for tracing the evolution of citizen rights and responsibilities through time and space. In my section of our panel, I will focus on the nuclear tests conducted in Nevada in the mid 20th century and the subsequent generations of downwinder citizens who radically reconceptualized their rights and responsibilities as citizens. It is my contention that government records are a crucial resource in documenting the actions that led to this radical reconceptualization of citizen rights and responsibilities within downwinder communities, while also serving as a primary source of documentary evidence for those who bear witness to the shared trauma of living downwind. The story of how a small section of Nevada desert became the site for over 1,000 above and below ground nuclear tests is, com is complicated. Its genesis can be traced to 1939 when a group of German physicists made a crucial discovery that bombarding a single atom with neutrons could theoretically lead to a split of that atom, which in turn would release enormous amounts of energy. The Manhattan Project was America's top secret response that culminated with the detonation of the world's first atomic weapon in the New Mexico desert on July 16, 1945. This was followed shortly after by U.S. detonation of atomic bombs over the civilian populations of Hiroshima, Japan, and Nagasaki, Japan, in August of 1945. In the ensuing years after the detonation of these weapons, the United States began building a nuclear weapons program in di direct response to Soviet advances that have resulted in the successful detonation of Russia's first atomic weapon in 1949. When tracing the history of U.S. nuclear activity in the immediate post-war period, the policies and procedures that would come to mark the oncoming Cold War quickly manifest. Post-war legislation created the Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Defense, and through these agencies, the country began to pour its resources into developing its nuclear technologies. In this context, new weapon tests were quickly scheduled and conducted at various island outposts in the Pacific Ocean. Between 1946 and 1962, the U.S. military in the Pacific conducted 100, 105 above-ground atmospheric tests. Both soldiers working in the Pacific during the atmospheric testing area as era, as well as downwinder island communities, would suffer elevated rates of particular cancers in the years following testing. To the detriment of many, it was during this era of Pacific testing in which many of the safety protocols, or lack thereof, that would govern nuclear weapons testing were established. The emergence of a domestic nuclear test site in North America was incredibly swift. With the Soviet detonation of their first nuclear weapon in 1949 and the rise of the Korean conflict in 1950, plans were accelerated to uh, identify a domestic atomic test site. The logistics and costs of testing in the Pacific made accelerated testing in that region unsustainable. The Armed Forces Special Weapons Project initiated Project Nutmeg in 1947 with a direction to study potential spaces in which a domestic test site could be established. Three potential sites in the arid west were identified and had varying degrees of potential. These three sites included the military controlled areas of Dugway and Wendover in Utah, Nevada, the Trinity Test Site near Alamogordo, New Mexico, and a windswept desert 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas. It was this latter location that would ultimately become the Nevada Test Site via an executive order from President Truman on December 18, 1950. National security imperatives born of the Cold War transformed a formidably a formerly recognizable Great Basin Desert into a series of pockmarked valleys full of littered debris and irradiated wreckage that will serve as a permanent legacy of what took place in the silent and secret spaces provided by the desert. As it turned out, these, the tests had a similar destructive effect on the communities who lived downwind. During the above ground testing period at the Nevada test site that lasted until 1962, the security precautions put into effect for the Utah, Nevada, and Arizona communities living downwind proved to be inadequate. The first indication that something had gone wrong came with a, with a blanket of fallout dust that began raining on local communities like St. George, Utah, and Mesquite, Nevada, 
These were small, relatively isolated communities with strong Mormon roots, places with citizens who looked on their proximity to the Nevada test site as an opportunity to prove their Cold War patriotism, something that had troubled many Mormons who often felt like outsiders within the national context. The spring of 1953 brought with it un unusually large losses in sheep herds that had spent the winter grazing in the mountains of southern Nevada and southern Utah. In addition to the disturbing number of deaths, sheep owners also observed that many of their animals appeared to suffer from unusual burns on their faces and bodies. Speculation quickly focused on two Nevada test site test series, Operation Tumbler Snap Snapper conducted in 1952 and Operation Upshot Knothole conducted in 1953 as the source of death and injury witnessed among the Cedar City sheep herds. My introduction to this story came when I processed records from the Utah Department of Health that are held in the collection of the Utah State Archives and are now available for research online. The correspondence, government reports, photographs, and maps in this record series paint a dramatic picture of the genesis moment that would come to reshape the small patriotic Southwest communities into communities of downwinders. When the six sheep herds were first reported, a team of US public health and safety officials and Atomic Energy Commission investigators were dispatched to observe sick lambs in Cedar City. Their initial conclusion was that radiation and malnutrition were the most likely candidates for the problems of afflicting the herds. A report was drafted to this effect that brought together the investigative work from seven different government agencies initially involved with analyzing the sheep losses in Cedar City. The Atomic Energy Commission was loath to compensate for livestock losses based on harmful radiation due to the precedent it might set for future claims of loss for exposure to the fallout tests from the Nevada test site. This led to the Atomic Energy Commission organizing a second investigation of the sheep herd losses in Cedar City in the summer of 1953. The investigators used in this second investigation had much closer ties to the Atomic Energy Commission, and this second investigatory group focused exclusively on malnutrition as the primary cause of the sheep herd loss. In August of 1953, all participants from the first and second sheep death investigations uh, met in Salt Lake City to review the evidence from both, both studies. At this meeting, there was a concerted effort placed on the first group of investigators to abandon their positions that radiation was a primary contributing cause to the, sheep, to the death of the sheep. At this time, the Atomic Energy Commission began a campaign suggesting that malnutrition and disease in the herd were, cite, were cited as the likely culprits for sickness and death within the Iron County sheep herds. It was also at this time that Atomic Energy Commission officials began advancing the premise that radiation levels from the Nevada test site were too low to cause radiation poisoning in those herds. With the resumption of atomic atmospheric atomic tests as part of Operation Teapot Test Series at the Nevada test site in 1955, Cedar City sheep owners who had suffered heavy losses in 1953 filed suit against the government for $177,000 in damages. This led to Justice Department lawyers placing heavy pressure on members of the first invest investigative team to officially change their position that radiation had served as the primary cause of the Cedar City sheep deaths. The trial took place in federal court in September of 1956. The government's defense maintained that fallout levels from the upshot knothole test series were too low to cause sheep death, and that the timing between the atomic tests and the subsequent sheep deaths was purely a coincidence. Judge A. Sherman Christensen sided with the expert testimony provided by the government, stating that the government was negligent in not warning sheep owners of potential fallout in the area, but nothing more. Nearly 30 years later, this ruling would be called into question when the declassification of formerly top secret government records produced as part of the investigation revealed that many of the sheep in question showed evidence of enlarged thyroid glands, a common side effect caused by an excessive exposure to radioactive iodine. I'll return to this court case and the galvanizing effect it had on an emergent downwinder community in the 1970s and 80s. The Department of Health records held at the Utah State Archives provide documentary evidence of the early environmental impacts nuclear fallout and radiation were having on the regions downwind of the Nevada test site. The effect of fallout from the Nevada test site on downwind human populations didn't take much longer to appear, as soon the small communities living in the shadow of the Nevada test site began to exhibit epidemiological trends for certain forms of cancer, as well as higher rates in birth defects that were far outside the margins of similarly sized communities elsewhere in the country. The catastrophic human losses that began to emerge in downwind communities are documented both in oral record, such as Sarah Elizabeth Fox's dynamic oral history of downwinders, as well as evidence found in government records. Death certificates held by the Utah State Archives offer direct evidence of death, as well as epidemiological data on the various types of cancer and health maladies that were becoming an outsized presence in small downwinder communities. 
These stories of human loss are devastating. Beyond the death records are the lives of human beings whose loss would often lead survivors to reconceptualize their rights and responsibilities as citizens of a government that had too casually put them and their families in harm's way. On this slide, I've included the death certificates of three individuals who died in 1965 and 1966 from cancers that would come to be linked to exposure to the types of nuclear fallout that downwind communities were too often exposed. I would draw special attention to the first, which is the death record of Sybil Deseret Johnson of Cedar City, who died in May 1965 at the age of 12 from acute leukemia. Without knowing the context this, of this record on its own, you might read it as a singular moment of human tragedy. However, the recorded history of the downwinder communities exposed the loss. According to a 2001 Deseret News article on these communities, Sybil is remembered by her father as a little taller than average with beautiful hair, a perfect blend of red and gold, touched with just enough curl to add a little grace. She was the peacemaker among her four siblings, two of whom were ele of elementary age during the atomic tests, all of whom were ushered outside school classrooms to watch pink fallout clouds pass overhead. She was learning to play the cello. She taught her brother ballet. An Iron County Record newspaper article dated April 23rd, 1964, listed all of the Johnson children in a piano ensemble festival. It was two months before Sybil was diagnosed. Soon after, the girl was so exhausted, she'd come home after school and go directly to bed. She'd get up for dinner and then sleep again until morning. This went on for weeks. When Dr. L.V. Broadbent first saw Sybil in his Cedar City offices, his diagnosis was that her health issues were being caused by exposure to pesticides, not fallout. This was a fairly standard discourse for the time, but as the same Deseret News story reports, the government has subsequently acknowledged Sybil was a victim of winds from the tests. Take the case of Sybil and her family and multiply it exponentially, and it becomes understandable how the impact of downwind disease and death led directly to a reconceptualization of self within key elements of downwind communities. It's my contention that the subsequent emergence of a politically engaged downwinder community emerged as an inevitable outcome of, the, of these government actions. This subsequent reconceptualization of rights and responsibilities among downwinders would play out in fascinating ways throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. In 1979, a second case was brought to federal court, this time arguing that fallout from the Nevada test site was responsible for the death and suffering of human inhabitants living downwind in the downwind area south and east of the site. At this time, government records that had formerly been classified became public, and the extent of the Atomic Energy Commission cover-up with the 1952-53 sheep death case came to light. In February of 1981, six of the original plaintiffs from the 1955 lawsuit brought a new suit to federal court asking for a new trial. They claimed that fraud had been committed upon the court by the Atomic Energy Commission and Justice Department officials. Judge A. Sherman Christensen heard the case again, and the plaintiffs were represented by Dan S. Bushnell. A settlement offer was extended to the government of $3 million for damages, but government representatives refused the offer. Evidence was heard over four days in May of 1982, and Christensen delivered his decision in August, ruling that at the time of the sheep radiation studies, the Atomic Energy Commission held a monopoly of information and that government experts and attorneys had deliberately acted to withhold certain pieces of that information from the court. Judge Christensen ordered that a new trial was to be held, but that decision was overturned on appeal by the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver. Eventually, the case made its way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where the 10th Circuit decision was sustained by a 5-3 to three vote in January of 1986. Another court case was brought against the U.S. government in the early 1980s and included residents from Iron County. This suit sought damages from the federal government and was initially successful on ruling from Judge Bruce Jenkins that awarded some damages to downwind cancer victims and their families. However, the, the case was appealed and the decision was again overturned by the Federal 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. I began my career at the Utah State Archives in December of 2002 when I was hired as a temporary project archivist tasked with completing the processing of Governor Scott Matheson's records. I didn't know it at the time, but Scott Matheson is a powerful representative example of this nexus of loyal U.S. citizen whose life is a downwinder growing up in Parowan during the above ground nuclear testing area fundamentally impacted his perspective and conceptualization of himself as a citizen and a government official. There are two distinct examples from his time as governor that demonstrate this. In January 1979, two years into his eventual eight-year term as governor, Scott Matheson directed that all federal and state agencies in Utah fully dis disclose and provide copy of government records that relate related to the nuclear tests at the Nevada test site or subsequent studies dealing with fallout from that testing.
This was part of an early effort by the Matheson administration to determine the best course of policy and action for Utah residents who had been exposed to fallout from the Nevada test site. Eventually, these records, as well as testimony from congressional hearings and subject files accumulated by Matheson's office, would be compiled into a record series that is currently in the custody of the Utah State Archives. These records are an invaluable resource for documenting downwinder history. They reflect a genuine effort by a downwinder to represent and protect the rights of fellow downwinder citizens within the state. And these records ultimately serve as the backbone for policy decisions and stances on the issue, issue of downwinder recompensation made by Governor Matheson, who would tragically bear his own downwinder fate and pass away from a rare multiple myeloma cancer in 1990. A second example of how downwinder communities reconceptualized their rights and responsibilities as citizens came with Utah's MX missile moment in the early 1980s. Records held by the Utah State Archive, Archives again provide a documentary source of evidence for how many in downwinder communities had shifted in their opinions and attitudes, and how this shift played out in opposition to what was being proposed as the single biggest nuclear project on Earth. In 1979, U.S. President Jimmy Carter announced the decision to move forward with U.S. Air Force plans to base the nation's largest nuclear deterring MX nuclear weapon system in the Great Basin Desert of Utah and Nevada. Immediately serious questions about the logic underlying MX and its potential to severely impact the region and its citizens came into focus. These concerns would come to be articulated by an increasingly vocal and unified resistance. The specifics of the MX missile and its attendant basing system speak to the surreal enormity of the entire project. The MX missile design included a multi-stage rocket fitted with 10 thermonuclear warheads. As daunting as the MX missile was in its destructive scope, the basing method surpassed it in terms of sheer audaciousness. Calling for the construction of 4,600 shelters into which an MX missile might be stored, U.S. Air Force planners proposed that these shelters be scattered across Utah and Nevada in the form of 200 individual oval racetracks, measuring 15 to 30 miles around with 23 individual bases per racetrack. In this scheme, a lone MX missile there would be 200 in all, would be assigned to each racetrack, its exact location among the 23 shelter bases masked from Soviet intelligence. The idea was commonly called a version of the old shell game by military officials and rested on the logic that should the Soviets ever initiate a first strike, it would be on a system actively engaged in keeping its missile locations moving and secret. For skeptics, the MX system was a Rube Goldberg nightmare of complexity and waste, foisted upon a fragile desert ecosystem, a Cold War Maginot line destined to undermine what Great Basin inhabitants knew of place, while also failing to adequately address a greater need to ramp down militarism and begin the difficult process of disarmament. The voices of multiple Utah residents, many of whom were downwinder survivors, live on through the MX historic record. Ultimately, it is this unique coalition of disparate voices finding common ground against MX that remains one of the most important legacies of that period. The MX opposition was unique in unifying a mixture of voices and opinions from both the rural interior of the Great Basin, as well as the larger urban opponents in Salt Lake City, Reno, and Las Vegas. The oppositional voice to MX wasn't monolithic, but rather a guiding set of principles that could find articulation among very different groups, often with very competing interests. Citizen pressure and the memories of betrayal from the Nevada test site experiments played a key role in ultimately dooming the MX proposal, which met its final end when President Reagan took office in 1981 and under pressure from Nevada Senator Paul Laxalt and Utah Senator Jake Garn scrapped the MX proposal. Again, a central figure to highlight in all of this was Utah Governor Scott Matheson. As mentioned, Matheson's office received correspondence from concerned citizens voicing their opinion on downwind and MX issues. During his time in office, Matheson established the MX Coordination Office, which became the central hub for information gathering and communication on all MX missile issues in the state of Utah. The highly effective resistance that established itself in Utah's MX moment demonstrates how within one generation, citizens had reconceptualized their rights and responsibilities to government. Whereas the eventual downwind communities had often construed the risk of living as neighbors to the Nevada test site as a patriotic national duty, the downwind generation of the 1980s actively rejected this assertion and mobilized in successful resistance against a federal attempt to once again place U.S. citizens in direct proximity to the inherent risks born of atomic militarism. The final area I want to highlight where government records reflect reconceptualization of rights and responsibilities comes with the passage of the Federal Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. To date, the RECA Act remains the most tangible, act, tangible action taken to address the legacy of atmospheric nuclear testing in Nevada and the impact it has had on nearby populations. 
The act, which was championed by federal representatives from Utah and Nevada, created a government fund that exists to compensate individuals and surviving families who suffered from radiation-related injuries and death that occur occurred before adequate safety warnings were given or safety protocols enacted in an affected downwind area. And just as they reflect the transformation of downwind citizens, government records again play a crucial role in establishing legal cause and appeal for compensation from the RECA fund. Today, government records are essential for making RECA claims as they place citizens firmly in time and space during the era of nuclear testing. America's foray into domestic, dom domestic nuclear weapons testing remains a historic moment that is still with us today. This was witnessed as recently as July of 2020 when Utah Representative Ben McAdams rece received press coverage for his efforts to insert language into a federal defense spending bill that would prohibit resumption of nuclear testing in Nevada, as well as extend downwinder access to compensation from the RECA fund. In a press conference explaining his amendment, McAdams was joined by Mary Dixon, a downwinder and powerful voice within the downwind activist community. It was an important contemporary example of a Utah representative drawing on the lived history and living record of, of the downwinders who radically reconceptualized their rights and responsibilities. A story that has an undeniable chapter within the sphere of government records and specifically the records held by the Utah State Archives and Records Service. As Gina mentioned, we are proud to preserve and provide access to the permanent records of Utah's government to its citizens. It is our hope and intent that our work will continue to assist citizens in understanding and protecting their rights while helping them comprehend their responsibilities in engaging and keeping their government accountable. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to thank you for your time and attention to our presentation today. Okay. Um... I'm going to pull up this slide one more time. A sincere thanks to all three of you for such thoughtful presentations. Um, I, I want to remind listeners that uh, the full archive of the conference program is, is available on our website at usgs.utah.gov. And in particular, given that we've discussed today discrimination of particular groups in uh, Utah history, um, speaking specifically of Gina and Mahala's uh, presentations. I want to uh, remind everyone, if you're listening to this prior to September 25th, our plenary panel uh, morning will be on Native American voting rights, very much in line with what you've, what you've just uh, heard. So I hope you tune into that, as well as to our keynote address by Dr. Lisa Tetralt on myth, memory, and the vote. Um, so again, thanks to all three of you. It's great presentations. And we can edit some of my questions out, but I just have one or two questions if you don't mind just sticking with me for a moment. Um, one is you, all three of you discuss how records outside of the Utah State Archives can animate the records that your institution holds. I'm wondering, um, what advice you have for potential researchers, how they would go about um, finding records that maybe are, are, are located beyond your archive, but can really, as I say, animate or flesh out the material that, that one might find there, for, you know, in particular the vital records and other types of records that you've highlighted. Any words of advice for researchers? Hmm. Well, I guess I'll try and tackle that. Um, I'm not really sure if there's any specific methodologies that are useful when you're looking to provide um, like historical context to these records. Um, I generally use the, the tools that I was taught um, at studying history as an undergraduate, uh, looking for primary sources and original sources contemporary to the time, especially, because that often does help you understand the, the records themselves better. So for example, um, since I've been working with vital records, some of the things I've looked for are sometimes other government records, like uh, in this case with the Native American birth certificates, I did search for administrative records like policies, procedures, or correspondence from the office. 
and I just didn't find any. Um, so that's when I started looking for the broader topics. Um, newspapers are absolutely wonderful. I'm so impressed with Mahala's discovery of the Davis County Clipper coverage of the registration process because I've known about those records and I've worked with the alien enemy registration before and I never thought to look and see what other people are talking about. And I know now that I'm kind of thinking about these birth certificates again, one of the things I would like to look into is maybe local government records like county commissions or city councils that might be discussing the issue of Native Americans living in their community or adjacent to reservations and just see what they thought about the subject. Right, right. Excellent. I, I would jump in really quick and just give a plug also to our amazing uh, reference archivists that we have on staff at the Utah State Archives. Um, government records can always be challenging, uh, particularly because government shifts and changes and moves and connects in so many different ways in so many different places. And um, our reference archivists have a wealth of institutional knowledge uh, that, you know, they can be a very good place to start uh, just asking a question and, and letting their, uh, their institutional memory sort of help guide the process as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you for those responses. Uh, I just want one more question for me. Um, you, you, all of you detail how records held by the Utah State Archives kind of reflected the discrimination of Native Americans, of Japanese Americans and other groups. Um, and how these groups at times did not have, you know, the recourse under the law. And it seems as though the way the records were created reflects how that discrimination was codified. I'm wondering how, if at all, did the process of preserving those records reinforce the prejudice and discrimination that you, that you detailed? Maybe this is just for my own edification, but I'm wondering, you know, for example, were there practices at the state archives that privileged, say, one group or community over another? Hmm. I think that's an excellent question. And it is something that we have been dealing with as a profession, kind of the silences in the records. Um, you know, I've, I've only been working for the State Archives for as many years as I have, and it's been very interesting to simultaneously be educating myself about issues of diversity and inclusion, and then seeing it in the records. Um, just for Utah's case in particular, I'm kind of thinking about how it's originated as a program under the Utah State Historical Society specifically to collect military records. So that's kind of the origin of our institution. And it's actually a really interesting story of how that all came about. And then you have the, you know, the introduction of technologies like microfilm, which um, was part of our collection process. So it's, it's definitely something that we are actively thinking about. And especially when we're speaking about access, so um, when we talk about digitization and online access, we are actively looking for including more voices in what's available uh, easily online. And I, I'm gonna add to, I think for a long time, there was um, this sense of the archivist as a completely neutral party um, in, in preserving history. And, I think that especially in recent decades that there's been more and more acknowledgement that we aren't. <laughs> um, and I think that that can be seen in, you know, collecting processes and in um, preservation processes and that kind of thing. So I think it's a really, really interesting question. It's one that the field as a whole is, is kind of grappling with right now. And I think it's something that we can acknowledge is there, but we're still trying to figure out how best to kind of change our practices or, um, or deal with it. Right. Yeah, I mean, just from one who, you know, like the rest of you who writes and researches history, it's good to be aware of, um, as, as you say, Gina, the, the silences in the record and the way in which the record may distort our perception of 
I mean, the archive is absolutely essential, but you know, on the other hand, we have to be aware of how the records were created, for what purpose, who created them. And there may be issues that need to be addressed. Certainly there are issues. And I think that the way that, you know, what you've presented today really helps us to, I mean, helps me to get a better sense of types of records and maybe um, what they do and do not reveal about the larger, broader society as well as the records themselves. Um, so I appreciate your, your words. Helping me understand that. Um, that's all for me. Thanks, you three. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all three of you for excellent presentations. Um, so I want to remind those of us. Uh, Thank you very much for three excellent presentations. Uh, appreciate your time and um, attention to uh, providing and sharing this history with us. To all those who are um, listening, thank you for tuning in. Just a reminder that uh, again on September 25th, we have uh, our, doc our keynote speaker, Dr. Lisa Tetralt, speaking about um, suffrage. And in particular, in relation to this, um, session that we've just heard. The plenary panel uh, will be on Native American voting rights. Um, so something definitely to tune into. I hope you join us and check out the rest of the sessions on our website at history.utah.gov or ushs.utah.gov. You'll find a link to the conference program from there. Thank you again. <laughs>